Um, so we live in an age where Judaism is highly fractured with sectarianism. We have the ultra-Orthodox, Hasidic, Orthodox, modern Orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionalist, Zionist, anti-Zionist, Messianic Zionist, secular Jew. Very little, if any, progress has been made in making headway into unifying the denominations of Judaism. How are we to lead a path to a Judaism that will one day be able to unify these fractures? And what has been the Sephardi approach that has allowed it to stay relatively uninfluenced by these movements? Thank you very much. It's a good question. And I'm going to comment on it, but I'm going to comment on it two ways. Preliminarily, historically, Sephardi didn't have all these divisions. Again, I'm talking about in the 1800s and earlier. In all our old fashioned tradition communities, they were solid communities. It didn't mean that we didn't have arguments. Sephardi are just as argumentative as Eskenazim. We had dissents, we had uh, people who believed this way, people who believed that way. But one thing that the whole community, whether they were more right wing, more left wing, they all held the community is the community, it stays according to halakha. And if individuals fear this way or fear that way, that's their business. But the kahal is always kashir. Everything that's done is according to the halakha. And that's the way it is. And didn't mean that people didn't all agree with that. But fundamentally, that was accepted in the society. Sometimes people say, well, so if I didn't live in backwards countries or in Muslim countries, they didn't know any better. False. So I knew plenty well. Many of them lived in countries that were very Europeanized. They spoke European languages. Many of the countries they lived in were under European colonial rule. They knew plenty about all the conflicts that Ishkenazim had in their intellectual life. So far, they had exactly the same conflicts. The difference was there was a tacit understanding we hold to the tradition. Right, wrong, or indifferent, we're holding on to the tradition. We don't want all the division, formal divisions. Ishkenazim didn't have that. Ishkenazim, God bless them, whenever two people disagree, they make three synagogues. They, uh, they, they have to have different movements. Okay. Ashkenazim were brilliant at organizational life, Sephardim less so, I have to say. Ashkenazim have made monumental accomplishments Sephardim never did. I take nothing away from Ashkenazim. Having said that, Ashkenazim also, because of their um, maybe Europeanization or that living in Christian societies, they broke into different fag factions. Among the Christian world, there are how many different denominations in Christianity are there? Zillions. Yeah. Always Muslims okay, have two main ones. Okay, they, they fight against each other, but it's two. But the Christians, they, they split into many different groups. So, so Ashkenazi living in European lands tended to also break into different groups. And that's, that's the way it was. Now, you say today, well, how are we going to unify all these groups? The answer is, forget about it. And the Mashiach comes, we'll be unified. When I was a younger rabbi, I spent many hours, hours and hours. I was president of the Rabbinical Council of America, which is the Orthodox Rabbinic Group. And I had meetings with the head of the reform movement and the head of the conservative movement. We used to have joint conferences and discussions, how we could find ways to bridge our differences. And after years and years of working, I came to the final conclusion, you're not gonna do it. We're not gonna do that. When well, Mashiach comes, we'll be united. So then do we give it? Do we say, well, we'll throw up our hands and give up? No. What we have to do is develop our own philosophy, what we think Judaism ought to be. And we have to teach that. Those who listen, God bless them. Those who don't listen, God bless them too. Eventually, in 100 years from now, they, maybe they'll agree that we're right. There's no advantage in getting into discussions and disputes because we're never going to convince anybody. Our goal is find those souls who resonate to what we're teaching in the hope that little by little, one by one, we're going to be able to change the world. To change the world altogether, we're not going to do it's a hopeless task. Forget about the whole world. Just concentrate on your family, your community, your society, your city, your group of people, and anyone who finds connections uh, with you. And that's the way you're going to find unity. So you have a Joseph Soloveitchik of blessed memory, who was a great, a great figure of the 20th century. Not just Eskenazi, he was a great figure amongst the Fardim too. And I'm, I consider myself a student of his intellectually. He made a distinction between Jews who are Brit Goral and Brit Yehu Jews. Brit Goral, Brit Goral Jews are Jews who are Jews by fate. They're born that way. They're stuck. They didn't choose to be Jewish. They're Jewish. They're Jewish maybe because anti-Semites make them Jewish. They're Jewish because they feel some national connection to the Jewish people. But they're not very tied into 
Mount Sinai. They don't really care about the mitzvot, but God bless them. They still have a strong Jewish connection somehow or other. But, and that's, these are also Jews. They have to have a covenant, but they're also a covenant of breed Yehud, of people, Jews, so to speak, by choice, by the destiny, by our belief in Torah, by our belief in mitzvot. It's a positive choice, not because anyone forces into it, but because we understand that this is a beautiful, beautiful way of life. And all both sets of Jews, whether they're more religious, less religious, they agree with us, they disagree with us, they're all, all started on the same team. The Havdil, when the, when the anti-Semites in the world want to kill Jews, they don't say, are you Sephardic, are you Ashkenazic, are you Haredi, are you right-wing, are you left-wing, are you... They, they, they hate all of us. It has no difference at all. So, so why should we let the, the, the anti-Semites define who we are? Instead of being defensive Jews, we should be, take the offense, so to speak, we should be offensive Jews in the positive sense of that term. We are Jewish because it's a practical, wise choice. We have a beautiful way of life, strong way of life, a way of perpetuating values and traditions to our children and grandchildren that make us happy, make us fulfilled as human beings. And we're not gonna give that for anything. And every, all Jews don't understand that. It's painful. And many were raised without proper religious training. And many even who were raised in religious training rebelled against it. They didn't have the right teachers, the right influences. My general philosophy is, I don't give up on one Jewish soul. I never give up on anybody. I'm ultimately an optimist. I'm an angel. Okay. I, I believe in optimism. Nobody is lost. I've had, I, over the years, I've been a rabbi for over 50 years. I started when I was 24 years old, 24 years old in 1969. Goes back a long time. I've known many people who came from backgrounds that you would never guess anything, that they'd have any connection to Judaism, and either they or their children or grandchildren are good to upstanding Jews now. Don't give up on anybody. I had one interview with a student years ago. He said, I was a reporter, actually, a Jewish reporter from some newspaper. I forgot which one it was. And he, after the interview, I asked him some questions about himself. And he was the, came in with a kippah. He was apparently a religiously observant fellow. And he said he grew up in a completely non-observant home. He didn't even know he was Jewish. But he, took, he went to Columbia University and he took a graduate course in the Bible as literature. First, he came across an article by, written by somebody with the same last name as he has. So he went to his mother, father. Who is this person? Do we have any? Yeah, that was my grandfather. Your grandfather was a biblical scholar who wrote a book, wrote an article about the Bible. Yeah, but we don't care. It's old fashioned. We don't care about that. But this kid's grandfather, who's dead for years, put his hand out over the generation and said, Sonny, come back. Your grandfather was a Torah scholar. Come to the back of the Torah. And the guy did. He came back. He learned. So I never give up on anybody. I've had so many cases over the years of people who came from very alienated backgrounds, very atheistic backgrounds, anti-Israel backgrounds. Okay. Be patient. And God works in mysterious ways. And if we're patient and do our thing, that's all we can do. So we can't, obviously, we're not trying to change anybody, but the risk that people might say, like, for example, we even talk about, we discuss, like, we want to have conversations with, let's say, a Karite or a Reform rabbi, just to kind of see if we could find common ground or we can understand each other's histories and learn to appreciate each other because we're still, we're all Jews, but it could also send out a confusing message. It could also, you know, you, you run the risk of maybe people becoming more attracted to another, you know, sectarian group, so to speak. So we, you know, there's always that kind of balance that you have to find. Um, so how do you approach that? Because I actually really appreciated your interview with Rabbi Mark Gala, but I believe he's reformed. And he kind of has that approach where, you know, bringing like a Jewish talk show where, you know, Jews can, from all different denominations, can come together and, and have discussions, meaningful discussions. Um, how would you advise people like us in approaching, uh, let's say, these different uh, groups? Excellent question. It's a good question. I, first of all, know thyself. Everyone's different. Different people are in different levels of development, different levels of thought, different spiritual rungs. Everyone's not in the same place. So for some people, if they hear a Reformed rabbi speak, oh my God, I'm gonna become a Reformed Jew, I'm scared. Don't go to the speech, I'm telling you. If you're, if you're nervous about it, stay home. You, want, you don't have to put yourself in a position of conflict if you don't want to. But if you're more confident, so to speak, you feel comfortable, Every, there's truth in, in what everyone, I shouldn't say that, but let me come, go back. 
Everyone doesn't have the truth. But sometimes there are sparks of truth in all traditions, believe it or not. Rav Cook wrote about the value of knowing about atheists and reform and anti-Zionists because he says, even though we certainly reject their teachings, there's a spark, that something in, within their movements that stimulated intelligent people to follow it. Let's find what is, the, what is their attraction and see how we fit that into our tradition. In other words, what does reform emphasize? Reform emphasizes personal autonomy. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a very nice value. In orthodoxy, very often we're taught, what does the Rebbe say? What, are the, what does the Chacham say? We follow that blindly. Reform, of course, rejects that. But most thinking Jews also reject that. Good, pious Jews aren't going to say, I close my eyes blindly. Whatever Rabbi so-and-so says, I'm going to follow most people, there are people that do that. There are Hasidim who follow the Rebbe. I'm not saying no, and God bless them. But for many, certainly secularly educated Jews who went to university, they're not going to think that way. So if I, as an Orthodox rabbi, want to bring those people back closer to the tradition, I have to understand where they are. I have to understand what values they have. How can I understand those values if I don't talk to them, if I don't read their writings, if I don't feel the connection with at least some of the virtues of them? If you go into a room thinking, I'm right and you're wrong, there's no, there's no conversation. But if you, if you go into a room and say, what can we learn from each other? Of course we disappear. I've had many meetings over the years with, with uh, Catholic uh, clergy, interfaith clergy. I was involved for years with interfaith projects. They knew ahead of time they're not going to convert me. And I know I'm not interested in converting them. The question wasn't that. The question is, what shared values do we have that can influence society for the better? I'm not going to here to argue with you or you to argue with me. But there are certain things we believe about family, we believe about uh, morality, whatever we believe. Aren't there things that we share? Same texts, same ideas, same principles, same values. Where we don't agree, let's, okay, we don't agree. You're not going to convert me, I'm not going to convert you. That's not our goal. Our goal is to understand how we can draw on the humanity that we each have. I think that's how we have to deal with the conservative reform, Karaites, whatever they are. I feel not only comfortable talking with people of different opinions, I consider it a positive value. I learned so much from people who don't agree with me, who I don't agree with. Years ago, I spoke at a conference sponsored by the United Nations of all things, and it was sponsored by the government of Bahrain. And it was about religious tolerance. <laughs> I, I, was, I was the only Orthodox rabbi in the room, but there were some, a few other, there was one other lady rabbi with a kippah from, from Italy. But everyone there was Muslim or Christian of some sort. And everyone spoke about brotherhood, sisterhood, and blah, 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 blah. So when it was my turn to speak, I said, you know what? One of the problems we have in our world is fanaticism. And fanaticism, a lot of it comes from the people in this room, our religions. We teach extremism. We're right, everyone else is wrong. How do we reach the level where we say, I'm, I am right. I'm willing to give my life for what I believe in. But I make room for you also. God is big enough for all of us. God created all of us. How, how can I develop a religious philosophy that is so big and so sophisticated that it makes room for people that I think are absolutely wrong, that they have, they're on the wrong track, but that God still loves them and they're trying in their way to get to God without me having to kill them or them having to kill me. The great error of modern times has been the tyranny of people who believe there's one way and one way only. It's my way and everyone else is damned. I recently dealt with the conversion of a person who grew up as a fundamentalist Christian who was taught from the time of a child that Jews don't go to heaven. It's not possible. You have to be a Christian to go to heaven. Long and short of it is long story. He wanted to marry a Jewish woman and he came to me, boo, 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 boo. I'm not going to tell you the whole long story. But he eventually converted to Judaism and he's a good Orthodox Jew. He puts on his tefillin every day. And it took him, he had a jump. And what made him jump from evangelical Christianity to Judaism was the idea, God is great enough to love all of us. Why would God reserve heaven only for one group? Like, what kind of God would that be? Why can you believe in such a God? God should love, like we say, the righteous of all nations. That's a Jewish teaching. When he understood that, he changed his whole hashkafa in life. And now his, his siblings who grew up also with uh, that teaching, they're all saying, yeah, we have, maybe we should reconsider. In other words, how do we promote this idea that God, not look at the world from human view, try to pretend we're looking from God's point of view. God loves all human beings. God created all of us. Instead of us killing each other and saying we control God and we alone have monopolies on God, 
Why don't we say, God's big enough for all of us. If we only could get the world to that level, halavai amen, then that's pre-messianic already. Beautiful. Well said. We, we totally what, agree. What an important segment yeah. that was. And, and, and before we go to the next one, mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that, you know, we just finished Tisha B'Av recently and uh, this, we were always taught about, you know, baseless hatred. And I find, maybe I'm wrong, but I find that like the Orthodox community always l looks at that from the perspective of their own kind of bubble and says the disunity within our own group, yeah. rather than looking at it as, seeing you know, it seeing it beyond like reform conservative, like we, we need to have conversations. We're one, we're a family, whether we like it or not. Um, and every single Orthodox family that I know of, at least the, old, the more ultra orthodox families, you, you have people who kind of go off the derech, and you have your face with a choice, either letting them, you know, cutting them off or you know dealing with it in in different ways, and and I feel like that is just, you know, that that's a reflection of the bigger problem. It's something that we're not dealing with as a nation, and I feel like you know people like you need to really be heard by people because it's it's such a such an important message. Very important. Let me give you a, a quick Divar Torah on Sinat Chinam. Years and years and years ago, we were in Jerusalem for Tisha B'Av. And I was, take, I was walking through the old city and meditating and thinking, and suddenly I was going over that passage that the destruction of the temple was because of Sinat Chinam. And it struck me, how could, what does Sinat Chinam mean? Baseless hatred. No one, there's no such thing as baseless hatred. You hate somebody, you don't like his religion, you don't like his race, you don't like his looks, you think he did something against you. You don't just go to a person on the street and say, sir, excuse me, I hate you. <laughs> no, there's no such thing. Everything has a base. So, so just a second, if there's no such thing as baseless hatred, what does Sinat Chinam mean? So as I thought about it. Sinat Chinam means that we hate the chain of the other person. We hate to admit that the other person has chain, has something good about them. We hate to admit that. So when you stop, say, this person is Haredi, this person is Sephardic, this person is Black, this person is White, this person is Chinese, and you hate them without understanding who they are, you refuse to see that they have chen. They also have something divine spark in them. They also have something beautiful about them. Once we hate to admit that, we shut the door between us and them, that's the, why the temple gets destroyed. In the temple days, what happened? There were sectarians. There were Kanaim, there were Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, there were different groups fighting against each other, and no one was talking with each other. They talked at each other. They didn't want to say, maybe there's some truth in what you're saying. Maybe there's some good in what you are. And once we block each other off, that's what Sidar Hina means. Amazing. That's <laughs> <So cool. laughs> um.